Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to another session on the tafsir of Surah al -Rum. Alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number 54, and uh, I anticipate that uh, we'll be able to complete the surah in this uh, session. So if you have a copy of the Mus'haf, uh, we will pick up uh, at verse number 54. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahu alladhi khalaqakum min da'fin, thumma ja'ala min ba'di da'fin quwwatan, thumma ja'ala min ba'di quwwatan, min ba'di quwwatin da'fan wa shayba, yakhluqu ma yasha'u wa huwa al-alimu al-qadir. God is he who created you from weakness then ordained strength after weakness, then ordained weakness and old age after strength. He creates whatsoever he will, and he is all-knowing and all-powerful. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully summarizes the various stages that we go through in, in this life. And the verse begins with Allahu الذي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ ضَعْفٍ That God is He who created you from weakness. Now what does this mean? That He created us from weakness. It means this min is min al-ibtida'iyya. Meaning that our beginning, our initial stage in this physical realm was a stage of weakness. And some commentators contend that va'af, that the weakness that is alluded to in this verse is a reference to the drop of semen that we were created from. That we, we were created from this lowly substance. We were, we were a helpless, single cell creature. And there are some verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of the, uh, the beginning of our creation, the beginning of our physical creation. In Surah Al-Mursalat, Surah 77, Ayah number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asks rhetorically, أَلَمْ نَخْلُقْكُمْ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينٍ Have we not created you from a lowly liquid? Because, you know, semen is something that is, is seen as something that is is, uh, is repulsive, it's something that's foul. So we created you from this, from, from weakness. You began as a very weak, fragile creation. Even in Surah Al-Insan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asks, He says, هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Has it not occurred to man that he was once something not even worth mentioning. You were a small, insignificant, helpless, single cell in the form of uh, a sperm cell. So some ulama say that, some commentators say that when Allah says that he created you from weakness, it's a reference to our state of weakness at the beginning of our creation. Others say that, no, this is a reference to the weakness of the child, whether it's in the, the womb or even when you're growing up as an, an infant, as a toddler, you're weak, you're dependent on others. Allahu alladhi khalaqakum min dha'fin He created you from weakness. We began as weak, fragile creatures, totally dependent on others. After this stage of weakness, Allah says, then he ordained strength after weakness. Now, this strength is a reference to the period of youth and maturity that as we, as we grow up, we become physically stronger, we become mentally uh, mentally stronger, we develop our mental faculties. So we, we have this combination of physical strength and mental strength. Whereas in the previous phase, 
from the moment of our physical creation, as we develop in the womb, when we come out of the womb as, as infants, Allah mentions that this is, this is a period of physical weakness and even intellectual weakness. Wallahu akhra, in Surah An Nahl, what does Allah say? Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'alamuna shay'a. That Allah is the one who took you out of the wombs of your mothers while you had knowledge of nothing, while you knew nothing. So this human being begins his journey in this life from a place of weakness. You are physically weak, you depend on others to to nourish you, to shelter you, to clothe you. You begin with practically no knowledge. The intellectual faculties are not yet developed. And then after this period of weakness, you are given strength, physical strength, mental strength. And then what does Allah say? ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ قُوَّةٍ ضَعْفًا وَشَيْبًا And then... He ordained weakness and old age after strength. So for those who who live a long life, they live well into their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, what happens is that it's, it's kind of like a bell curve that you reach the pinnacle of physical strength, mental strength, intellectual prowess, and then... There is this period of what? This period of decline. So this weakness that comes after strength, this weakness that's associated with old age, is what what people experience, this, this decline at the end of life. And this shows you, brothers and sisters, that, that we, human, unlike Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose power is absolute, whose power is consistent, whose power is inherent and unchanging. Unlike Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we go through these fluctuations that our power comes from an outside source, that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that weakness is ordained upon us, power is, or strength is ordained upon us, meaning that we, we don't, these qualities are not inherent. So power is bestowed upon us. Strength is bestowed upon us. And this ni'mah is also taken away from us. So we go through these fluctuations. And you know, this is one of the meanings of Allah's attribute of, of being qadil. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consistently all-powerful. There is no rise or fall. There is no decline in His power. Whereas you and I, we go through these, these different stages. In Surah Al-Hajj, there is, a, there is a similar verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these stages that we go through. And this is also a, a reminder that, you know, in the same way that we go through stages of development in the womb, when we come out of the womb, we go through these stages of development. And this is also to, this is really meant to make us reflect on the stages of development that that lie after death. That why is it that we assume that this progression, that this development ends with, with death? So in the same way that there were different phases that we went through in the womb, and there are different states that we go through in Adam al-Dunya, when we transition to Adam al-Barzakh and Adam al-Akhirah, there are also stages of development there are there are conditions different conditions that we have to traverse so in surah al-hajj verse number 5 allah says ya ayyuhan nasu in kuntum fi raybin min al-ba'th o people allah is addressing all human beings that if you are in doubt about resurrection then consider the fact that فَإِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابِ If you have doubt about the day of judgment, if you believe that with death, death marks the extinction of man, consider all of the stages that lead up to death. 
خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ تراب. We created you from dust. ثُمَّ مِنْ لطفة. And then we created you from a sperm cell. ثُمَّ مِنْ عَلَقَةٍ We created you from semen. And then a, a clot. ثُمَّ مِنْ ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَةٍ مُخَلَّقَةٍ وَغَيْرِ مُخَلَّقَةٍ And this clot turned into a mass that was formed or unformed. لِنُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ we we do we 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 tell you this to explain to you that man is on a journey. It's a journey that began in the womb. It's a journey that continued in the Adam and Dunya and this temporal world, and it's a it's a journey that will continue after death. When نقرر في الأرحام ما نشاء and we cause whatever we wish to be in the wombs. إلى أجل مسمى only Allah knows exactly how long. This fetus will remain in the womb. Some, it's exactly at nine months. Some come out two weeks late, a few days early, a few months early. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines how long this appointed time is. This is ayah number five from Surah Al-Hajj. And then we we take you out of the womb as, as infants. And then you reach... Maturity. And some of you die earlier. And some of you continue to live until you, you go back to the lowest point. You know, it's interesting that human beings begin their lives as with weakness, and then you go back to that original weakness. You know, if you look at those who are very elderly, they're very similar in their in their mannerism, especially if they become, become very elderly, they become very similar to toddlers. They have to be fed, that they're not able to go to the bathroom on their own. SubhanAllah. This, and this is what Allah means by ardal al-umur, that the, the weakest position. And if you think about it, that, you know, we have to puree Food for our toddlers, for children, because they don't have teeth. They have a weak digestive system. When people become very advanced in age, when their health begins to, begins to decline, they also, you know, they have to also be fed. When you have a toddler, you have to potty train them. You have to take them to the bathroom. You have to clean them. There are also some cases where someone becomes very elderly and they also need assistance when they go to the washroom. So it comes full circle, my dear brothers and sisters. And this is also a reminder that we should never be arrogant because no matter how powerful you are, eventually we go back to this, this state of helplessness. We began with weakness and we shall end in that, that state of weakness. And it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the infinitely, the, everla the, the, the one who has everlasting strength, who does not decline was always in a state of power. So these different phases, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, And He, has, he is the all-knowing. There's, there's wisdom behind the passing of these stages. And He is Al-Qadir. That whereas you and I, we fluctuate in our physical and mental capabilities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constant in his in his qudra, in his power. Verse number 55. And on the day when the hour is come, the guilty will swear that they had tarried but for an hour, thus were they perverted. Now, this is a very interesting verse in the Quran, and there are many verses like this in the Quran where you have people who come out of their graves and they have, it's almost as though they, they don't have a grasp on the passing of time. And so you have people who, who, who rise from their graves 
and they say that you know it seems that we were only we only tarried for an hour now most of the mufassireen of the quran they say that this is a reference to alimul barzakh that it seems that barzakh went by so quickly that to them to the, to the wicked it seems as though it was only a single moment it didn't last long so this is a reference to alimul barzakh now we understand here that these people those who who whose spirituality whose souls are underdeveloped they they don't have a perception of how long they were in barzakh in fact even in even in dunya you know if you look at for example ashab al kahf ashab al kahf they slept for over 300 years and you know so it's not only uh, the wicked you know in dunya we have examples of those who were in a long slumber and when they awaken from their slumber like ashab al kahf they were asleep for over 300 years when they woke up they thought that that they'd been sleeping for an afternoon for a few hours so you see that there's they don't have they don't understand how much time has passed now why is that it seems that in barzakh people have different levels of consciousness and your level of consciousness in barzakh is related to the maturity of your soul now there are those who whose barzakh will be like a dream like experience meaning that they will experience barzakh, but they, it will be similar to sleeping, meaning that they their, their perception of alamul barzakh will be dulled. And there are those who, who have a higher level of consciousness, and they have a better perception of time uh, when they go through barzakh. Now, why is it that the, the day of judgment is called the hour? Why is it called the hour? Now, there's a lot of discussion about why the day of judgment is called the hour. Some have said that it's because of how quickly Allah takes people to account. That despite the fact that there are potentially billions and trillions of people who will be standing for hisab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sari'ul hisab and an hour refers to a small duration of time so some of the mufassirin have said the day of judgment is known as as-sa'a and it refers to how swiftly Allah uh, takes account of people how, how quickly he he uh, takes them to account yuqsimul mujrimun the those who are those who are the, the wicked, the guilty, will swear. They will make a qasam. يُقْسِمُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ مَا لَبِثُوا غَيْرَ سَاعَةٍ That barzakh for them did not last very long. And it, and it makes sense, brothers and sisters, that they felt that, that barzakh was very brief. Because if you, if you can imagine someone who's going to be doomed, they're going to be given you know, the death penalty, for example. If someone is in a holding facility and they're waiting for a severe punishment, they don't want that, that moment to arrive. And therefore, no matter how much time they spend in that holding facility, it's going to seem like it's very brief because, because they dread what's going to happen next. You know, these are people who were who were deluded, you know, because, because they had no relationship with God, their souls are underdeveloped. And because of that, in Alam al-Barzakh, there are many things in Alam al-Barzakh that they have trouble understanding. You know, even when the Malaika speak to them, they have trouble comprehending many of the realities of Alam al-Barzakh. So 
they have a lower a lower level of of consciousness. There are certain things that they are aware of, but it seems that that time, their relationship with time, their understanding of time, is uh, is affected. And when they come out of their, their graves, it's almost it's almost as though it was a blur. They they have no they have no recollection of how long they tarried in Alamul Barzakh. Because they think about they think about barzakh, they, because everything about their thinking is within a dunyawi framework. Because in alam al dunya things are are governed by time. They assume that that everything, even after death, is similar to dunya. So their understanding of some of the realities of barzakh are are quite limited. Ayah number 56. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ وَالْإِيمَانِ لَقَدْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْبَعْثِ فَهَذَا يَوْمُ الْبَعْثِ وَلَكِنَّكُمْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And those who have been given knowledge and belief will say, Indeed, you tarried in God's book until the day of resurrection. And this is the day of resurrection, but you knew not. So you see that there's a contrast here between ayah number 55 and ayah number 56. There are some who come out of their graves and they have no idea what has happened to them. It feels as though Barzakh was just for an hour. So they're, they're disoriented. The guilty ones are disoriented when they come out of their graves. And those who have been given knowledge and iman, and this is important, brothers and sisters, because what has value in alam al-akhir is not just knowledge. There are many people who have knowledge, but on the day of judgment, in the alam al akhirah you know, they will not be in a good place. Shaytan, for example, Iblis is a person of knowledge. He's a being that possesses immense knowledge. But his knowledge has become a hijab. It's become a veil that has prevented him from perceiving certain realities. Those who have understanding are those who have knowledge and belief. They are the ones who are going to be telling these the guilty people who are disoriented, indeed you tarried in God's book. Meaning, and this kitab is a taqwini kitab, meaning that you spent however Allah decreed for you to spend in alam al-barzakh. Meaning that you, you remained in barzakh until yawm al-qiyamah. It doesn't matter how long it was. And this is the day of resurrection. So you see that some people, when they come out of their graves, they will be so disoriented that they won't understand what is happening. But those who have iman and who have ilm, and some narrations indicate that you know the the highest application of this ayah are the ahlul bayt, you know, the, you know the prophets. These people who have knowledge and and faith, they will inform these people who are disoriented who come out of their graves, that this, that you remained in Barzakh until Qiyamah. And now, this day is the day of judgment. So they have a much better understanding of what is unfolding. فَهَذَا يَوْمُ الْبَعْثِ This is the day of resurrection. So the guilty don't, have an idea. They don't know how long they spent in Barzakh because again it's because their their spiritual consciousness was not at a high level. You know, they were almost like in a state of slumber. And even when they are resurrected there is a certain time period, at least when they initially come out of their graves, they're disoriented. There's a, there's a type of sakra that overtakes them. This is the day of judgment, but you but you knew not. You had no knowledge. 
And this shows you that that iman, that what we know about alam al akhirah, that it's all it's all based on knowledge, iman, faith. The foundation of it is ilm. Ayah number 57. On that day, the excuses of those who do wrong will benefit them not, nor can they make amends. It's interesting, brothers and sisters, that on the day of judgment, there still will be people who are going to make excuses. There will be people who will lie, who will try to make, who will try to justify their behavior. And you see, but of course, there's no, there's no excuse on that day. You know, for the vast majority of people, they will not be justified in their, in their misdeeds. You know, for example, and there are many different excuses that, that people will give on the day of judgment. You know, in Surah An-Nisa, uh, verse 97, Allah says, The angels who take the souls of people, so there, there are people who die, there are angels who seize, who capture their souls, while they are oppressing themselves. So these are people who died in a state of sin. They've died in a state of disobedience to Allah. So the angels will ask, you know, what was your condition? Why are you like this? Why did you die in a state of rebelliousness to Allah? Why did you live this life of corruption? We are seizing your soul and we see that your souls are corrupted. Your, your souls are polluted. What was your condition? They'll play the victim card. That we were mustab'afin, that we were overwhelmed, we were overpowered. We were victims. You know, we lived in an area where we were influenced by the culture, by society, by, you know, the different trends. We were affected. We were overtaken, overpowered. So the excuse is what? One of the excuses is that, you know, everybody was doing it. Right? It's the environment that I grew up in. It's the culture that I grew up in. I'm a victim of my environment. The malaika will say to them that if you felt... And these are people who are mu'mineen, but they relinquished their faith because they chose to live in a place that did not allow them to practice. Or they lived in a, in a place where, you know, there were no sign, there were no places where they could develop their, they could practice their faith, they could learn about their faith. So the angels will say to them, was not Allah's earth vast for you to travel? Why did you choose to live in a place where you were unable to, to hold on to your identity? Why did you choose to live, to put yourself and put your family in a place where you put yourself at risk? You weren't able to practice. So for you to say that, you know, this was the environment. Allah said, my earth is vast. You could have gone to a place where, you know, there is a community where there were other mu'mineen, a place for you to raise your children a place where there's a masjid. Why did you choose to live in a place that, that had an adverse effect on your spirituality? So this is one excuse that's given. Another excuse that, that people give is that, you know, we followed our leaders. We were misguided by, by our, our leaders and those who we looked up to. You know, in the Quran it says, Lola antum lakunna mu'mineen. If it were not for you, we would have been believers. So it could be people that you revered, friends. If it were not for you, we would have been believers. So again, placing the blame on others, placing the blame on the culture, the society, on certain personalities. And then the answer, those who are being blamed will respond 
to these guilty people who will do the finger pointing. And we're we, were we the ones that blocked you from guidance? You, you followed us willingly. No one coerced you. Some people will blame shaitan. Shaitan. On the day of judgment, ilahi, shaitan deceived me. Shaitan tempted me. Shaitan on the day of judgment will say what? فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not blame me, Iblis will say. Don't blame me. Blame yourselves. I had no power over you. I had no authority over you. All I did was I suggested, I invited you, and you accepted my invitation. Some people will... You know, on the day of judgment, there's a there's a beautiful ayah. We covered this when we spoke about when we gave the tafsir of Surah Al An'am. In verse one one forty nine, Allah says, "Qul fa lillahi Say to Allah belongs the decisive argument. On the day of judgment, Allah's argument against each and every one of us will be decisive. We won't have an, an argument. We won't have a case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَقُولُ لِلْعَبْدِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will say to his servant on the day of judgment, عَبْدِي أَكُنْتَ عَالِمًا O oh my servant, were you knowledgeable? فَإِنْ قَالَ نَعَمْ If the person says, yes, I was knowledgeable, Allah will say to them, why did you not practice what you knew? So those who have knowledge will be held accountable for their knowledge. Why didn't you practice what you knew? Why didn't you apply your knowledge? Now someone may think, okay, I might be off the hook if I, if I plead ignorance. If I say that I was ignorant. You know, some, some people, they think, to, they think it's you know, uh, you know, as the saying goes, "Tis folly to be wise." That it's better to be ignorant. Ignorance is bliss, right? Ignorance is not bliss, brothers and sisters, because on the day of judgment, Allah will say to His servant, Allah will ask His servants, "Akunta aliman." Some of them will say, "No, I'm ignorant." Bel kuntu jahilan. I was an ignorant person. What will Allah say to the ignorant? Afala ta'alam ta'hatta ta'amal? Why didn't you learn? I gave you all of the resources to educate yourself, to gain knowledge. And especially in this era, brothers and sisters, there, there really is no excuse for ignorance. Oh, the books are available. Even if you even if you don't want to purchase books. PDFs are available free of charge, lectures in all languages. There's no excuse for someone to say that I, I'm ignorant. You know, but some of us, we don't use our time wisely. That's a separate issue. But the information, the knowledge is accessible. And then Imam al-Sadiq says, فيخصان. The, the, the knowledgeable will not have an argument before God. And the ignorant will not have an argument. They will not have, a, have an excuse before Allah. يخصن, they will be defeated. So that this is what Allah means when He says, Imam al-Sadiq says, this is the meaning of the decisive argument that Allah will have over His servants. Verse number 58. وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ وَلَئِنْ جِئْتَهُمْ بِآيَةٍ لَيَقُولَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا مُبْطِلُونَ And indeed we have set forth for mankind in this Qur'an every kind of parable. And if you bring them a sign, those who disbelieve will surely say, you make nothing but false claims. وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ And indeed we have set forth for mankind. 
we have to always remember, brothers and sisters, that the Quran is not only for the Muslim audience. It's not only for the Arabs. It is for all of humanity. And this is why when you look at the Quran, the Quran employs many different ways, a diverse, diverse ways in bringing people towards God. The Quran is replete with commandments and prohibitions. It's replete with stories of the past and parables. It contains ethical stories. There are jurisprudential rulings within the Quran. And different different parables resonate with different people you know people respond to the quran differently the quran has something to offer to everyone every the, every parable it this is a book that is for humankind and allah says we have set forth for mankind in this quran every kind of parable there are some people when they read the quran for example, Surah Yusuf really resonates with them. There are other people where the, the life of Musa السلام, is particularly inspiring. There are others who, who, who are affected by certain passages in the Quran, certain surahs, certain, certain examples, certain metaphors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives stern warnings in the Quran and in other in other places he issues severe warnings he gives glad tidings and he gives warnings so Allah employs the the approach of the the carrot and the stick because people are different there are some who respond to wa'ad and there are others who respond to wa'id so the Qur'an is diverse in its approach because of the diversity of the audience. There is something in this Qur'an for everybody. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala in bi-ayatin. So the Qur'an is this spiritual pharmacy. It has the medicine for every ailment of the heart. But there are some people who will refuse to take this medicine. There are some who, who are blind. There are some who, who have rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who refuse to believe. Not because, so not because of an epistemological issue, but rather there is there are some negative traits within them. There are some vices that have dominated their hearts. And if you bring them a sign, those who disbelieve, they've already made up their mind. They are unwilling to even approach the word of God with objectivity, with an open mind, with an open heart. What will they say? They'll dismiss this message. They will dismiss the messenger and the message. And they will say, you make nothing but false claims. Mubtilun encompasses all of the ways in which people have sought to discredit the messenger and the message. It refers to all of, this, all of the disparaging remarks that were made against the prophets and against the scriptures. You know, they used to call the prophet Sahil, that he's a magician, that he's Kahin, that he's, he's possessed by jinn, that he's insane, he's majnoon. They would say that the stories that he's sharing are asatir al awwaleen, they are fables of the past, myths of the past, has no value. So the Quran is diverse, it's this rich spiritual garden. But there are some people who will refuse to enter this garden. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كذلك, in verse number 59 Thus does God seal the hearts of those who do not know. There are some who will not benefit from the Quran. Why? Because their hearts are sealed. 
Why are they sealed? Because, now of course Allah doesn't arbitrarily seal the hearts of people. But if someone is stubborn, someone who, who refuses to even objectively approach the word of God, who arrogantly turns away, who is defiant, who is rebellious, they lose this spiritual faculty. You know, brothers and sisters, the heart, now of course I'm talking about the spiritual heart. The spiritual heart, if it is not used, I mean, if people do not reflect, they don't think about these important philosophical questions, these deep questions about where we came from, what is our purpose, where are we going? If we don't consider these deep questions and we don't look around us, we don't examine creation to try to arrive at the truth, if we don't engage in this mental exercise, then the heart will become sealed. Meaning that the qal is similar to a muscle. And the function of the heart is to to ponder over creation to arrive at something that is beyond creation. You know, the heart has this ability to go from the empirical to the metaphysical. This is an exercise. That if, if the heart does not, if the, the spiritual muscle is not used, it will lose function. In the same way that if you don't use the muscles in your body, eventually they lose function. So if someone is so careless and so arrogant and so close-minded that they refuse to consider and to think and to ponder over these important questions, and they turn away because they're so egotistical that they don't want to surrender to anything. They don't want to acknowledge a higher power. The only power that they acknowledge is their own selves, is the, their own, is the self. Because they don't want anything to govern them. They want to be free. They don't want to bow their heads to any, anything other than their own selfish desires. Allah says, كَذَلِكَ يَطْبَعُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Thus does God seal the hearts of those who know not. And it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals the hearts of people who are ignorant. No, there are some people who are ignorant, but they have a desire to learn. They, have, they desire, they have a thirst for the truth. Allah doesn't seal the hearts of these people. But Allah seals the hearts of the people who don't know and who refuse to know, and who refuse to even consider these important questions. They, they don't want to learn. They don't want to, they don't want to even consider or entertain the idea of God or the hereafter. Allah puts a seal on their hearts. He cuts off the, the faculties of understanding. And again, this goes back to the idea where Allah says, الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ كَذَلِكَ يَطْبَعُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That those who reject God are described as those who don't know. Because the, the epitome of ignorance is to be heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And iman is, is predicated on knowledge. Iman, the foundation of Iman is knowledge. And the highest knowledge is Ma'rifatullah, is to know God, is to be familiar with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the final verse, ayah number 60, Fasbil, inna wa'da Allahi haq, wa la yastakhiffannaka alladheena la yuqinoon. So be patient. Allah is addressing the Prophet. So be patient. God's promise is indeed true. And let not those without certainty uh, shake you. So be patient. God's promise is indeed true. The Surah Ar-Rum began with a promise. 
في أدنى الأرض وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون. Allah made a promise to the believers that the Romans would eventually defeat the Persians in a number of years. And, and that is when the believers will rejoice. Allah promises. He promised to elevate the Mu'min, to grant them victory. And this, again, remember, brothers and sisters, that Surah Al-Rum was revealed during the Meccan period. The Muslims are a, are a persecuted minority. The future looks very bleak. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after beginning the surah with a promise, and then speaking about the fate of believers and disbelievers, and then the discussion about the, the signs, the ayat of Allah, that, that why is this Lord able to make such promises and fulfill such promises? It's because everything is in His control. He's the all-powerful, the all-knowing, and then the surah took us through the the signs, the external signs of God's power and His majesty, as well as the internal signs. And then the, the surah comes full circle by telling the prophet to be patient. Yes, things are not good, that you are under great persecution. You're, you're, you are an oppressed minority. Your companions are being abused and harassed. But be patient. Why should you be patient? Because Allah's promise is true. What is Allah's promise? Allah has promised many things. But one of the things that Allah has promised, and one of the most important things that Allah has promised is what? That the end, the final victory is for the mu'mineen. So have patience. And patience is... The most supreme virtue, in fact, when the mu'mineen enter paradise, the malaika they greet them. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace be upon you because of your sab. The angels don't say peace be upon you because you prayed or because you fasted or because you fought jihad or because you gave charity. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Because everything whether it's prayer, whether it's fasting, whether it's, you know, uh, facing difficulties in life, resisting temptation, it all goes back to the virtue of sab. All of these things require patience. Fasbil. So be patient because the promise of Allah is true. Do not allow those who don't have yaqeen, you know, those who are badgering the Prophet, who are insulting the Prophet, who are ridiculing the Prophet, Allah is telling the Prophet, don't let them shake you because they themselves don't have certainty. Your enemies who, th who appear to be very bold, who appear to be strong, they are standing on a very weak foundation. Don't be deluded. Don't be deluded by them. Don't let them shake you because they themselves don't have yaqeen. They don't have certainty. Be firm, be resilient, be steadfast. And this is the key to success, my dear brothers and sisters, that what allowed the Prophet, you know, who's in Mecca at this period, to, to be expelled from Mecca and then to come back about a decade later, conquering the same city that he was banished from. This was because of his sabr and his steadfastness. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Akhir Da'wana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa Sallallahu Ala Muhammad wa Ali Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Ajjal Fajham. Any questions or comments? So uh, in verse 56, it says, uh, those who are given like knowledge and uh, Iman. Um, could you talk a little bit about what is the difference between Iman and Taqwa? So <clears throat> if you look at 
What is the difference between Iman and Taqwa? Uh, yes. When you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, now, again, I'm speaking in, in general terms. You know, here, when you look at uh, you know, those who have knowledge in Iman, this is a very specific context. You know, these are people who are telling those who are disoriented on the day of judgment that this is the day of judgment and uh, you tarried for a period that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. We have some hadith that say that this is in reference to uh, the imams, perhaps the prophets, those who are the divinely appointed guys who will, who will have, you know, in, in some ways an administrative role on the day of judgment. But in general terms, you know, Iman and Taqwa are uh, basically Iman is a prerequisite. You know, it's impossible. It's possible for someone to be a mu'min, but not a muttaqi. But it's impossible for someone to have Taqwa, but not have, uh, have Iman. So Iman is one of the conditions of uh, Taqwa. And in fact, uh, the highest level of Iman is uh is taqwa. When you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, Allah says, you know, ذَٰلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That this Quran is guidance for muttaqeen. Who are muttaqeen? الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَىٰ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ So when Allah describes the people of taqwa, one of the descriptions is that they have iman. And of course, iman is not just belief, it's manifested in our actions and you know, through prayer, through charity. So in a nutshell, uh, Iman is one of the uh, conditions of, uh, of Taqwa. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. And um, talking a bit more about Barzakh, how much of an effect would the punishment of Barzakh have on people if they don't really recollect it, if it seems like it was just a quick hour that passed by? In the same way that when you have, when you have an awful dream, you suffer immensely, but when you wake up, you might not remember everything that happened, but you do remember feeling disturbed. You, know, you don't know how, how long, you, know, you might sleep for eight hours, but you don't know how long your, your, your nightmare was. You know, your nightmare could have been a few moments. So even though you might not be able to, to remember how long it was, that doesn't negate the fact that there was, there was suffering that took place. I mean, Allah in the Quran, he mentions that Fir'aun and the supporters of Fir'aun, they are presented, they are, they are given a preview of Jahannam, يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا they are, they are given a preview of Jahannam in the morning and in the evening. So this shows you that, that there is some sense of time in Barza. But uh, why is it that they don't, when, when, when they come out of their graves, they don't, they, don't have, they don't really know how much time had lapsed. And this also, you know, this is a very philosophical discussion. It could be related to the fact that when their souls are uh, reunited with their bodies, with their physical bodies, that that's one of the effects that, uh, that takes place, that when the, when the physical body is reunited with the soul, there is this kind of, uh, this, this, this effect of forgetfulness. Let me just plug my laptop in just one second. Yeah, so this is really one of the mysteries of uh, of Alam al Barza. This, you know, this kind of uh, you know, a lot of scholars really wonder why is it that when they come out of their graves, they uh, they don't seem to know how long they spent in, uh, in Barza, which is why I mentioned this idea of of consciousness. There are there are different levels of consciousness. In, uh, in Barzakh. And in fact, there are different levels of consciousness in dunya. There are certain people, they have a higher sense of awareness. 
And there are other people who are just wandering aimlessly in life and they, they can't even tell you, you know, what's beneath their nose. So our spiritual states are much more enhanced in Alam al barzim So the one who is not, who's heedless will be, will be very heedless, meaning that their, their level of awareness in Alam al barzim will be uh, very limited. So we do have narrations that speak about this kind of sleep state. There will be people who are like sleepwalkers in Alam al barzim They'll experience some things, but, but, uh, their, their souls are not mature enough to kind of perceive a lot of the realities of uh, Barzim. Uh, and in verse 55, there are the word our is mentioned twice in two very different contexts. Could you maybe uh, talk about what the implications of that might be? So the the verse number fifty five, you're saying hour is mentioned twice, right? Because they say that it feels like we were only here for an hour, and then they talk about when you're there for the hour, like the day of judgment. So <clears throat> when when the verse says yom etaqum usaa, this alif and lam is is ma'rif, meaning that this is a uh, a definite a definite noun. So it's referring to something that is. That is definite, which is the day of judgment, as sa'a. Whereas uh, the second occurrence of sa'a in this ayah is referring to that that perceived time period, which is an hour, which really means the, the you know those who are guilty, the the corrupt, when they look back at barzak, they feel that it didn't last very long. It, it just it was merely an hour. So the first sa'a is a reference. It's it's a uh, it's a, uh, it's a definite noun, which is a reference to the day of judgment, a sa'a, whereas the second is a reference to a short period of time that refers to how long the, the guilty people felt that they spent in barzim, which in their mind was very brief. All right, thank you. And, and um, in the pre in verse 55, it talks about... Mm -hmm. Um, having having strength or weakness and strength and weakness again. Um, have scholars kind of talked about another dimension to it beyond just the physical strength, weakness, and uh, weakness, strength, and weakness? I mean, as I mentioned, that there, there is the combination of, of mental and physical uh, weakness. So Beyond the, the, the mental the mental and physical weaknesses and strength, I haven't seen any scholar discuss discuss this from a, uh, from a spiritual uh, uh, perspective because spiritually, you know, if someone develops their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the spirit can continue to, uh, to grow stronger. It doesn't, it doesn't inevitably have to experience that, uh, that decline. So, Given the, the context that the, the strength and the weakness that is referenced in this verse is, is definitely a reference to the, uh, the, physical, uh, the physical decline, the physical incline and decline, but it's also the, uh, the mental capacity. Because if you look at, you know, you know I, I mentioned Surah Al-Hajj, verse number 55, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the end of the, the ayah, he says that, there are some who are made to die and others. There are some who are made to go back to the lowest point, which is you know the old age. They go back to a period where they know nothing after they had known, meaning that they start to lose their knowledge and they become senile. So the combination of Physical, the loss of physical and mental strength has been mentioned by the Mufassirin, but 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 nothing beyond that. And um, could you talk a little bit about how uh, the spiritual 
I, I guess one, one thing that's a little confusing for me, or just I've, I've wondered about is, as a person's mental facilities define, what effect does that have on, on spirituality? Because it seems like there's a strong, like that, that those things would have a correlation with that. You know, you know they don't, you know, I, I think, you know, some people have this impression that, that there is a direct correlation between our, our ability to cognate and our spiritual development. I mean, it's possible for someone to be pious and God forbid, and, you know, they're learning. And then at the end of their lives, they, you know, they suffer an injury and, you know, they, they develop, um, they develop amnesia and, you know, they're not able to, uh, to use their, their intellectual faculties anymore. Now, this doesn't mean that they've, you know, they've lost their, their knowledge and their, uh, their iman because, you know, there are some ahadith. Many of you are familiar with the narration from Imam Zain al abidin where he says that on the day of judgment, you know, that the levels of paradise are equivalent to the verses of the Quran. And it will be said to, to a believer, that recite and ascend. Now, if the Quran is preserved in our minds, chances, if it's only preserved in our minds and the word of Allah has not penetrated into our hearts, it's very possible that we will not be able to remember it, the Quran. You know, and it's it's similar to this idea. You know, you know when someone dies, when someone passes away, we do talqeen. We dictate to them. You know, before someone, you know, when someone's dying on their deathbed or when we put them in their graves, we recount all of the fundamental beliefs. Why is that? We say to the mayyids, you know, if, if the angels come to you and they ask you about your Lord, tell them, Allah is my Lord. That's the Quran is my book and the Prophet is my messenger, the, the Qibla, the Kaaba is my Qibla. We go through the ABCs. Have you ever thought about why? Why is it that we go through the ABCs of Islam when we bury someone? It's because when, when, this, when you're shocked, when you're in a state of fear, you forget even the most basic things. Have you ever, have you ever taken an exam and you've been so... You've had so much anxiety and you're so terrified that you, you, you draw a blank. You can't even remember anything. So when you're afraid, you forget the things. You, you forget these basic realities. So it needs to be dictated to you. Now, if the Quran only existed in your mind, you've just memorized the Quranic verses, it will depart. But if the Quran has been internalized, and it's been absorbed by the heart, it doesn't matter if your mind doesn't work anymore. Because the knowledge and the ma'rif of, of Allah rests in the heart. And it resides in the heart when we internalize it, when we practice it. So someone might have their memory completely wiped out, but the Quran still resides in their hearts. And on the day of judgment, they're not going to have any problems. And then you might have someone who has a sharp intellect, but the Quran only exists in their minds. It hasn't penetrated deep into their being. So you might have someone who cannot recall a single ayah of the Quran, but the Quran is in their hearts because they learned the Quran. And then, and this person may be a very spiritually elevated person. Then, then you might have someone who's memorized the Quran, who can teach the Quran, but doesn't practice. Such a person, you think on the day of judgment, such a person will be able to remember the Quran? No, because on the day of judgment, you're not drawing from your mental memory. You're drawing from your spiritual memory. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Uh... Let me know, inshallah, what surah you guys decide. 
for our next uh, for next week, and uh, we'll go from there. Inshallah. Uh, we'll do that, inshallah. Exactly. Keeping the balance.